Good morning. Today we are celebrating, celebrating the ministry and the gift that God gave us in the way of Pastor Godfrey, the sanctified work that he did in behalf of God's people. And recognizing that we thank God that we haven't said goodbye to him for the last time, and that indeed another servant of God has gone to be with Jesus, who is the servant of us all. Let's open with the singing of our first hymn, and that is, Built on the Rock, the Church Doth Stand.
continue now with the remembrance of baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In holy baptism, Pastor William Godfrey was clothed with, clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness that covered all his sins. St. Paul affirms, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. The apostle also writes, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like, the, like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Christ is risen. He is risen we have come together to seek God's comfort in our sorrow and to rejoice in the promise of the resurrection. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you wept at the grave of your friend Lazarus, and you consoled Mary and Martha in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn the loss of Pastor Godfrey, and dry the tears of all who weep. Calm our troubled hearts, dispel our doubts and fears. We thank you for bringing William to faith and giving him the gift of eternal life. Strengthen us with your word and sacraments, and keep us in the saving faith until we are united with you and all the saints, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our attention is directed to the 23rd Psalm. As uh, Pastor Godfrey would hear that oftentimes when I shared private communion with him, I would usually conclude with the reading of Psalm 23. And I would use the King James Version as well. May we be comforted in the rich gospel here, knowing that the Lord is not just a shepherd, but my shepherd by faith. We belong to him and he belongs to us. And that we know in this journey of life, one day we will, not maybe, not possibly, but we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. We sing now Amazing Grace.
I did serve with Pastor Godfrey for a number of years here at Zion. In fact, he installed me here uh, in, in preaching for that installation. One thing I remember about him oftentimes, whether it was Bible class or sermons, he would reiterate and emphasize, it has to be in the Bible, right? It's not your feelings. It's not what everyone else is doing. It's not science or popular consensus. It's the word. And that word is now being shared with you to give you comfort, the same word that gave him comfort and assurance of eternal life in heaven. Job 19 tells us, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead, were engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. We're also reminded in John's Gospel, those comforting words of Jesus before his betrayal, be shortly before his crucifixion, there in the upper room he told his disciples and he tells us, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have not told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And our final reading uh, before the next hymn is in Paul's first letter to the congregation in Thessalonica, reminding us of what we can expect on that last day and that in a real sense, uh, the dead in Christ are sleeping. Their bodies will wake up. Their soul at this moment is with Jesus in heaven, as Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And yet their remains will wake up in a glorified state. And for this we further thank God. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is God's word. We sing now thy strong word.
grace and mercy and peace and comfort is all yours. From God our Father and through his only Son and our only Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. That word of God that Pastor Godfrey really wanted for the basis of the, today's message is found for us in Luke 17, beginning at verse 10. So this is Jesus speaking. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. This is God's word. Let us offer a brief prayer. Lord, take my hand and lead me upon life's way. Direct, protect, and feed me from day to day. Without your grace and favor, I go astray. So take my hand, O Savior, and lead the way. Lord, when the shadows lengthen and night has come, I know that you will strengthen my steps toward home. And nothing can impede me, O blessed friend. So take my hand and lead me unto the end. Amen. Dear family and friends of Pastor Godfrey, it should be maybe somewhat obvious to some of you that he had a tremendous influence on the service that we're using here today because he put a lot of thought into this day. And obviously, not for his benefit, he's in a better place. He's with God, he's with Jesus but for your benefit and to the glory of Jesus' name. It's interesting that for him at this moment, death has died. There is only life for him, indeed eternal life, in the house of the Lord. He was a servant of God. He was a gifted servant. He was blessed in many ways. He's well-tooled to be a shepherd under Christ, the good shepherd. I still see a shut in. He's in his 90s, lifelong member. He remembers, so many of these people remember going to school with Pastor Godfrey. You know that Pastor Godfrey was baptized here, confirmed here, went through Zion Lutheran School here. And he often mentions to me this shut-in. He says, he has such respect for Pastor Godfrey because he saw how smart a guy he was. He says, you know, he really could have done anything with his life and probably made a lot more money. And that being true, we know what I say this not to elevate Pastor Godfrey, and he would not want that either, not to boast in him, but to boast in the God who created him and sanctified him and so blessed him and gave him that serving spirit. I saw him less than two weeks before he passed, and I have to be honest, I don't know if he ever realized he retired. Okay. Uh, he would say things to me, and you're, you're right that uh, things had kind of slipped for him a little bit towards the end there, but um, in his mind, he was not a resident of that nursing home, but he was their pastor. <laughs> God continued to bless him with that fervent desire to share Christ and to live for Christ. And again, it's not to praise him, but to praise the God who made him, who saved him and sustained him, and indeed also used him for the furtherance of Christ's kingdom. Yes, a servant of Christ. He was cognizant. He was fully aware that this was not something he earned. That's something that he deserved. He was painfully aware of his need for a savior. I look back to when I gave him communion. It was in February when I gave him communion. And when it came to confession of sins, he may not, surprisingly, he always knew who I was. Uh, 
But he may not always have known who was still alive and who had gone on, because he would ask me those questions about certain people. But he knew how to confess his sins. He knew how to own up to that sin and that in the Lord's Supper, he had Jesus' true body and blood to further assure him and confirm and cement in his heart that he is a blood-bought child of God and an heir unto eternal life in heaven. And so, this is really about his Savior. It's about his Savior's love for him. And so also the words that he chose. I'm going to read them in their context, but not from the King James. <laughs> uh, so here we have Jesus. and It's kind of interesting. Yesterday's gospel reading was from Luke 9 when... Jesus makes it clear, that, or Luke makes it clear that Jesus is now journeying from Galilee to Jerusalem. It's his last trip to Jerusalem. And so that reading yesterday in the gospel reading, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And now the chapters that follow connect Jesus to that journey towards Jerusalem. And in the reading that pastor chose, beginning at verse 7, Jesus said, Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, Prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? The assumed answer is no. So you also, when you have done everything you have, were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now there are other parables that Jesus uses, other illustrations that Jesus uses, where he speaks of a servant, a disciple, being one who, who, who should have some compliment you might say, well done, good and faithful servant. Those aren't the words that Pastor Godfrey chose. These are the words that he chose, recognizing that he received more than he could ever give. You cannot outgive God. And recognizing in these words, it wasn't his service to God wasn't about a paycheck, indeed. It was about love for God, love for God's people. And, and also, beyond that, he was also one who served other pastors. You may know that when he was in the Arizona, California district, he served as a circuit pastor. And in so many ways, those maybe five years that I was able to really work hand in hand with him here at Zion. I looked to him as my pastor. I actually looked to him almost as a semprof in many ways. The man knew his stuff. And he was always there, not to belittle, never to belittle and make you feel dumb for asking a question. And again, this is to God's credit in blessing him and making him a blessing to us. Because the bottom line is, we know that we have a Savior who gave us greater service, gave Pastor Godfrey greater service. For Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He was there to serve Pastor Godfrey. Jesus came to reassure him that in the challenges of ministry, in the challenges of life, in the changes of life, in the chapters of life, in the seasons of life, Jesus was there with him, emboldening him, strengthening him, comforting him, reassuring him, reminding him of his call, reminding him of God's grace, reminding him that in all his failures, he is forgiven, and so are we. As I was given that honor and privilege of serving with him, 
he did leave behind something that I want to share with you. You may know that we had now in heaven with Pastor Godfrey, uh, our office secretary, Kim Kotecki. And they were very close. Uh, she was like a daughter to him in many ways. And during that time of ministry with him, it came up to Holy Week one, one year. And back then, Zion used to have, uh, on Good Friday, a 3.30 service and a 7 o'clock service. And they weren't the same service. The 7 o'clock service was a Tenebrae service. The 3.30 service was a, a different kind of service. And I simply asked him, Bill, could, could you do the 3.30 service and I'll focus on the Tenebrae service? And, and he said, yeah, no problem. So I go over to the office on Good Friday morning, and he's sitting with Kim dictating to her on that Good Friday morning, uh, you know, what he wants to do in that service, you know. Don't do today what you can put off for tomorrow, I guess, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of looking at Kim. I'm not judging. I'm not judging, but I'm just watching. But he had everything all written out in his handwriting, but it was easier for her to hear him read it to her and type it up. And, um, but I want to share with you a portion, because I have in his handwriting that document. And I'll leave it with the family. Then I made a copy for myself already. But in that document, he gives a, a wonderful uh, expression of faith. Uh, well, we know he had faith. He showed that faith and preached that faith so often. And in this portion of that Good Friday service, he was writing as if he was the centurion there at the foot of the cross. And as a centurion that he witnessed Jesus speaking those seven statements from the cross. And so now I'm going to share with you what he wrote in regards to that centurion on Good Friday and then also his commentary. It's, it's brief. An earthquake struck. Feeling the earthquake and hearing those seven statements led me, speaking as a centurion, to exclaim, surely this was a righteous man, surely this was a son of God. That ends what we know about the Roman centurion. Later generations would give him a name and tell us that he became a Christian. The truth is we have no idea what happened to him. We'd like to believe that the Holy Spirit led him to faith in Jesus and that we will see him someday in heaven. What we do know is this, the centurion was right. This was a righteous man. He led a perfect life, and his perfection becomes ours by faith. He is the Son of God. He came from heaven and then returned to heaven in triumph. On Good Friday, we remind ourselves, he did it all for us. He reassures us every day, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. And I, I couldn't help but share those words with you as, as you and I have that comfort of knowing as we so often heard him say and remind us, there is only one way to heaven. There is only one way to the Father. There is only one way to that house of the Lord. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through him. And I, I think of how much Bill loved gathering with God's people. It, it really reminded me of uh, the confirmation verse, in a sense. Uh, you have it on the cover of your service folder. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Kind of carrying through on that confirmation verse, he sought to gather with God's people, to be encouraged by them, and to encourage them as well. He loved probably any and every potluck, <laughs> as long as there wasn't fish, right? He didn't? Yeah. yeah. So uh, he, he just loved, loved that idea of getting together and uh, enjoying food with others. And so you can think of him as we go across the parking lot in a little bit to enjoy the luncheon. But he is enjoying a feast now, and will continue to enjoy that feast with all of us in Christ in the glories of heaven. What a, what a blessing we have to have known him and to be reassured that, indeed, God the Holy Spirit will give us every confidence of being with him. And I leave you with this 
analogy that I've probably used more than, in more than one funeral already, but I, I find it to be very encouraging. That for hundreds of years, the people of Europe looked out over the Western Sea called the Atlantic Ocean and wondered if there was anything beyond. Some claimed that if you sailed west, you would sail off the edge of the earth, that there was nothing out there at all. In fact, inscribed on the coat of arms for the nation of Spain was its national motto, ne plus ultra, which means there is nothing beyond. Then one day, Christopher Columbus and his crew sailed west. Many months later, they returned to announce that there was a land beyond the sea which was rich beyond their wildest dreams. It was a glorious paradise, they said. It all led to the king of Spain changing the motto of his land to what it reads today, plus ultra, which means there is more beyond. And so people also wonder today whether there is anything beyond the grave as they watch the remains of loved ones being lowered into the earth. Like Christopher Columbus, Christ sailed off into the unknown. He sailed into the dark waters of death, but on the third day he returned from the dead, thereby assuring us all that there is nothing beyond, that there is something beyond the grave. There is heaven, there is paradise. There is that paradise beyond all comparison or expectation. There is a heavenly Father who waits for us with outstretched arms to welcome us into the mansions he has prepared for us. Only Jesus opens that door. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And so the comfort that we always had, and who knows how many funerals Pastor Godfrey uh, preached and performed, is always based on that Easter message, that Jesus is alive. We worship a living Savior, not a dead Savior. He's a God of the living, not of the dead. And through him and because of him, that Savior, the servant of us all, we will be with Pastor Godfrey, and we will be with our Lord, the servant of all, forever. God bless us with that comfort and that assurance and that confidence, and God help us to uh, certainly not let his work, Pastor Godfrey's work and his message, just fall to the ground, but God help us to share that same message, which is based on that word of God that is always truth in opposition to anything else, this is truth. The truth that gives us comfort of forgiveness, life, and eternal salvation in Christ. Amen. Let's now join to confess our saving faith in the triune God with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with the singing of In Christ Alone.
Let us stand as we close with prayer and the Lord's Prayer and God's blessing. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are always with us, especially when our hearts are heavy with grief. Send us your spirit so that even as we grieve, we are filled with hope. You have convinced us that your son Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that our loved ones who have fallen asleep in Christ are resting in peace with you. Let nothing shake our confidence in your promise that we will be united with you and with them in glory forever. Lord, in your mercy. What great mercy you have shown us, Father in heaven. Through your Son's resurrection, our hope is alive and our inheritance is certain. The bliss and security we will enjoy in your presence are blessings that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Shield us with your power and give us faith to trust in you in every trial until we inherit the glorious riches you are keeping for us in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Gracious God, we see your abiding love and the kindness shown to us by family and friends. As we receive comfort and encouragement from others, we are experiencing your care. Help us bear all our burdens patiently. Be the strength of your people now and in difficult days to come. Lord, in your mercy. Oh Lord, support us all day long till the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And together we pray his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With believing hearts, receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the closing hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives.
the congregation and the family invite all of you now to uh, gather for a luncheon over at the gymnasium just behind me. And uh, family also asked that maybe I'd have the prayer at this time. And so as the family will be first to go over there, uh, they, they can start uh, gathering. And uh, we have all that opportunity as well to, to offer not only our, our sympathies, but uh, certainly uh, those remembrances. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Lord God, we thank you for bringing us together around the word and certainly focused on Christ. Help us to keep Christ foremost, his victory being our victory, and certainly Pastor Godfrey's victory. And uh, so bless us as we gather together and bless us and fuel us with the food so that whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of your name. And together we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. And I guess in memory of Pastor Godfrey, I should have had an amen between those two prayers, right? <laughs> okay. So I'll usher you out. Yeah.